Hi everyone, this is David from Overthink, here to continue our discussion of William James's theory of religious experience in his book, The Variety of Religious Experiences. And I want to continue the discussion uh, of the feeling of reality, the sense of objective presence that is a part of uh, human experience and how humans construct the real. And I'm going to use that then to lead us into talking about a distinction that is central to this book. And that is a distinction that William James draws between two types of religious believer. These are what he calls the once born religious person and the twice born religious person. He actually uses a couple of different names for these two characters at various points in the book. Sometimes it's healthy minded versus the sick soul. So just keep in mind that distinction in case I slip and use those change uh, those terms interchangeably. So you have on the one hand, once born healthy minded character, and on the other hand, a twice born sick soul. So who are these characters? To get there, again, we have to go back a little bit to the sense of reality. So recall from my previous lecture that according to James, we have this sense of reality that allows us to construct the world and get a sense of what is a piece of furniture in the universe and what isn't. Um, he talks about this sense of reality as the foundation of our ontological imagination. It allows us to imagine what is part of the universe um, versus what isn't. Now, in page 58, he talks about this. So he says, everything that I've said leads to the following conclusion. And so this is how he defines that feeling of reality. He says, it is as if there were in the human consciousness a sense of reality, a feeling of objective presence, a perception of what we may call something there, more deep and more general than any of the special and particular senses by which current psychology supposes existent realities to be originally revealed. Um, so again, it's as if human consciousness has this feeling for reality or this perception that there is something there that goes beyond the senses, even though psychology in the late 19th century, according to James, assumes that reality is furnished exclusively by the senses. So only what is given through us through the world or the realm of the senses can ultimately make it into our conception of reality. And he says that's not that's not true because the sense of the real operates beyond the limits of the senses. Now, now that we have this understanding of the feeling of reality, one conclusion that follows according to James is that we have to accept that there is a fundamentally irrational dimension to human experience that rationalist philosophies simply cannot handle. They cannot explain and they cannot explain away. And that's why he says that there is a mystical truth to human experience because there is something that our minds have to them that allow them to give reality even to things that are not sensorial, uh, like the concept of God, like the concept of heaven, like the concept of hell, so on and so forth. And this means that we should think philosophically now as rationalism being the opposite of mysticism. Um, so rationalism is not opposed here to irrationalism and the opposite of mysticism is not empiricism. The, the real distinction that he draws is between mysticism, which recognizes this mystical, irrational component of our lived experience, versus rationalism that tries to reduce everything to the operations of a rational mind and that accepts only that which can be rationally explained. If that's the case, then religious experiences will not fit the bill because they are fundamentally mystical and therefore irrational or maybe even irrational. Now, these experiences that are produced by this mystical feeling of reality, as I mentioned before, they are of many kinds. You can have many kinds of religious experiences, whether you're a Buddhist, whether you're an American transcendentalist, whether you are a Catholic or whether you are a Hindu. The only requirement is that your relationship to the divine be serious, right? You have to have this genuine conviction that what you believe in 
you believe in because it is real, because you feel it in the flesh. And James makes the argument that even though there is a great diversity of religious experiences, we can actually boil down the diversity of experiencers, i.e. the the subjects, the people who have these experiences, into two categories. And these two categories are the once-born character and the twice-born character, or the healthy-minded and the sick soul. So let's talk about these two characters that are interesting to James because they highlight two different sensibilities within the space of the religious. So let's begin with the once-born believer. Now, think about the once-born believer as somebody who is fundamentally optimistic in their approach to religion. And they are optimistic, not just in the sense that they believe that good things will happen, but in the sense that they believe that the world they were born into is itself a good world that holds the possibility for happiness in it. And so when we say once born, or when James says once born, he's talking about people who find divinity and happiness and joy in this world. That can be either because they have maybe a conception of God as belonging to the world, or maybe because they equate divinity with nature itself. And so one example, according to James, of a healthy-minded, once-born character is Walt Whitman, whose adoration of human nature and of nature itself put divinity at the center of the world of experience rather than in some world beyond this world. Now, the issue with the once-born character, with this optimistic approach to religion, is that even though it can give us a kind of naturalist understanding of the divine, and it can make us feel spiritually at home in the earth, in its most extreme forms, it can become a kind of pathology. And he uses the term congenital anesthesia to describe the kind of pathology that this optimistic attitude can engender, again, in its most extreme forms. And he gives the example of the mind movement of the late 19th century to capture this. Now, the mind movement was a movement in the 19th century. You can think of it as the 19th century's version of uh, what we now call New Age spirituality, uh, like that book, The Secret. Um, You know, like if you really manifest something and you really think about it and channel your energies into producing it, it will become true. Now, that's not new, even though maybe that particular formulation is. But in the 19th century, there were already people who thought that if you believe something truly and hard enough and you channel all of your being into that belief, that belief would come true. And the problem with this hyper-optimistic attitude is that it can make you, according to James, insensitive to the badness, to the suffering, maybe even to the evil that can occur in the world. And so if you're always a happy-go-lucky spiritual character, uh, you turn a blind eye to all the things that are problematic in this world. And so you end up uh, deifying, potentially, the status quo. And so here we have the first character, the ones born who is just born into this world and believes that they can have and find happiness in it. Now, the second character is the entire opposite um, figure as the ones uh, born soul. The twice born soul or the sick soul is somebody whose approach to religion is fundamentally pessimistic. And James explains this by saying that people who are sick souls deep down have a very low threshold for suffering, either for seeing the suffering in others or for experiencing suffering on their own. And because they have a very low threshold for enduring or witnessing suffering, they are led to a pessimistic, though not fatalistic, understanding of spirituality, where they look around them, they see suffering and evil everywhere, and so they cope with it by making the claim that we can only find happiness to some extent negatively or in another world. Uh, So it's very different than that happy-go-lucky 
think of Walt Whitman's um, adoration of nature. Here we have more of an indictment of the world that we live in and a desire to find an exit from this world. And according to William James, this too can become deeply pathological if taken to the extreme. So the pathology is a risk in both cases, to be clear. The real danger with the twice-born character is what James calls an extreme case of anhedonia. And anhedonia is a medical term for people who cannot experience joy. So it's the opposite of being um, in an anesthetic condition. Um, when, with anesthesia, you can't feel anything. With anhedonia, you only feel what is bad and you're incapable of positive emotions. And he gives the example of Tolstoy as a character that embodies the most extreme form of sickness of soul. Although he also mentions other philosophical traditions like the Epicureans and the Stoics from antiquity as falling more to the, to the twice-born character than to the once-born character. And so he says, in its most extreme form, this highly pessimistic attitude leads to extreme anhedonia, as in the case of Tolstoy, or it can lead in an even worse case to what James calls panicked fear. And that's the position of a religious person who lives in constant fear because they see the world as essentially burning and as always being at the risk of annihilation at the hands of the divine. And so the reason that this character is called twice born is because according to James, they need to be born twice in order to achieve happiness. And what he means by that is that first, the sick soul needs to be born into this world, into this real world. But because they see this world through a pessimistic lens, they believe that they have to be born a second time. They have to be reborn into another world where the promise of happiness will finally be paid off. Um, and that's why he says at one point that the twice-born character or the sick soul lives in a two-story universe where you have the empirical world of human time and space. And then there is a second story, which would be heaven or hell, um, depending on your um, conception of that or nirvana or whatever. Um, and then the idea or the goal is to escape into uh, that upstairs. And so we end up with this distinction between the healthy-minded, once-born believer and the sick soul who is twice born. And the difference between them ultimately conceal maybe a fundamental similarity between them. And that is that both of these characters face a fundamentally similar problem. And that is, according to James, that they are facing the problem of being a divided self. Um, this is a central concept in this book, uh, the notion of the divided self. And James makes the argument that once you adopt a religious position, whatever that may be, you do end up recognizing maybe two layers to your condition or to your existence that are at odds with one another. Um, and for example, he cites St. Augustine a lot in his discussion of the divided self, um, because for those of you who are familiar with the writings of St. Augustine, especially in the first 10 chapters of the Confessions, where he talks about his struggle coming to Christianity. The problem for St. Augustine is that we are beings of flesh. Um, we are carnal beings. And that carnality, that fleshiness to our existence, our materiality, our organic bodies, our animal instincts, are always going to be at least a little bit at odds with our spiritual desires and the kind of spiritual existence that we want to attain. And so each believer, each religious subject is divided at his or her core um, along this kind of line of nature versus spirit. And that's something that each religious thinker needs to try to reconcile on their own independently of whether they are once born or twice born. 
Now, James does recognize that even though the divided self is a problem for anybody who is religious, it really becomes a harder problem to solve for the twice-born character, for the sick soul who is pessimistic about this world. And the reason for that is simply because the once-born character does believe that there is a possibility of reconciliation in this world. Happiness, joy, transcendence of whatever kind can be attained within the span of a human life, assuming that you, of course, do the right things, live in accordance to the right principles. But the twice-born character, the pessimistic one, they don't even believe that that reconciliation is possible in this world. And so for them, the divided self is something that is only overcome in another world, in the world to come. And so that can weigh a little bit more heavily on the sick soul than it does on the healthy-minded one. But what both of them can do is live in accordance to their belief systems and really attend to those experiences, especially those intense mystical experiences of deep religious significance as a way of trying to find some kind of re reconciliation between mind, um, um, I'm sorry, between uh, nature and spirit, between um, this world and the other world.